Hello friends and welcome to our program today. I'm Dr. Willie Nutt with San Jose Word of Faith uh, Christian Center and this is our Bible study that we have each uh, Sunday morning. We're going to be re-engaging at a message that we began quite a few weeks ago. It's entitled The Tongues Controversy and uh, we're going to continue with uh, a statement from Apostle Paul. Uh, here he's describing the believers and the warfare that we all encounter and he gave us some tips on how we can handle them and in the following verse, he makes it clear to us that we need to be praying with all kinds of prayer and supplication. And that's in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, verse 18. It says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. This is Apostle Paul speaking to us, giving us instructions on how we should pray. Uh, let's read it again. Ephesians 6 and 18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication. That word supplication means definite requests. You need to be specific when you're praying to God. Uh, in the spirit. Um, and we talked about this. How do you do that in the spirit? Uh, when we were back in the book of Romans uh, 8 and 26, uh, we pray as we're prompted by the spirit of God and the Holy Spirit uh, intercedes for us and prays on our behalf. And we'll say more about the interpretation of that. And watching there unto with all perseverance and supplication, definite requests for all saints. So you just pray for yourself. You pray for all of those that uh, you are aware of that uh, may need an assistance from the God, from God. It may be those who are your brothers uh, and sisters in the church. Uh, it might be some situation on the job. It might even be your manager who's having difficulty. He may not even be saved. And so uh, uh, the word definite request is for whomever uh, we are prompted to pray for. And here it says that uh, we're sometimes we're to pray uh, or give requests to the Lord in the spirit. Uh, 1 uh, Corinthians 14, 17, For thou verily give of thanks well, but the other is not edified. So here we're talking about uh, praying in here by virtue of the fact that uh, the other one is not edified. He's not built up. He's not charged by what you're saying because he doesn't understand because you're praying in the spirit. You're praying in other tongues. Understanding that for those things that you're not aware of that needs to be prayed for, uh, the intercessor, the, the Holy Spirit will assist you and praying the proper prayer uh, that will be met by Father God and by the Godhead. And so uh, we have an assist uh, through the Holy Spirit. The parakletos is a term in the uh, Greek, the one who stands alongside with us in opposition to those things that oppose us. And so we're praying in the Holy Spirit. He takes it and translates it in, into words that is acceptable to Father God, understanding what our needs and our petitions are, and understanding what God will grant. Uh, so we've gone through that in some detail in previous weeks. You might want to look at some of the previous uh, broadcasts. So speaking in tongues may also be done in public in accordance with 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. However, we're not going to get into that. Uh, uh, there's some strict rules on that govern how we're to use the Holy Spirit in uh, the public forum amongst people who are unaware and unlearned in spiritual things. Uh, there are some rules, and the rules are given in 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter. We may touch on it just in passing, but I'm not going to spend a whole bunch of time talking about when and where and why not we should uh, use uh, the Holy Spirit, I mean, speaking in tongues. So it's primarily we're going to focus on your personal prayer, uh, speaking in other tongues and your personal prayer. Uh, and then later at some point, we'll talk about all the other aspects of the uh, ninefold gifts of the Spirit, the charismatic gifts. Praying in tongues in your personal devotion is to build you up Praise God to build your spirit man up. Uh, it is not understood by those who are present or in the same room uh, because it is a mystery spoken and that is directed to Father God. And uh, that's supported 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, and the second verse may be sufficient. Yes, it is, I think. We'll say more about some of the other subsequent verses, but this will explain what I'm saying. 1 Corinthians, the 14th chapter, and the second verse here says, For he that Speak of in an unknown tongue, speak of not unto men. Now stop right there and pause. And this is where people miss it. If you're speaking in an unknown tongue, I'm not talking to you. You don't understand what I'm saying. It's not going to edify you. I'm speaking in another language uh, that uh, you don't comprehend or understand. So unless it's interpreted, then that should not be spoken in a form where, where you're present, unless it's explained in advance. Now, the one who's in charge of a church service or prayer service can give you permission to pray in other tongues, but I want you to understand that person's praying and just look at it like another dialect. A person may be uh, from another country 
who's going to pray in their normal native dialect, you want to understand the word they're saying. The same thing is true if one is praying in tongues in a service where they have been reached to do so, so there won't be confusion because the host of the people that are coming uh, may not be saved, and they may not be Christians, and they may not be under may not be aware of what speaking in tongues is, so that we reserve that as something that's done in the inner form when those who are primarily there are those who are believers who understand fully how uh, the Holy Spirit operates and how they can, uh, it can be expressed in a, a form where most of the, some of the people don't speak in other tongues, they speak in their native dialect. But the way you look at that is that you don't need to know what they're saying, they're not talking to you. If it's something that is for you, then there will be an interpretation that's given. If it is not interpreted, it's simply a prayer to the Lord for themselves. So it's an individual prayer that they need the Lord to assist them, and they want to pray in the Spirit rather than praying out their mind because they know their mind doesn't fully know uh, what the appropriate words are that need to be articulated and presented to God so He can respond to them. Let's read the word verse again. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue, this means it's a tongue they don't understand, it's known somewhere, uh, it may be a tongue of men, a tongue of angels, or maybe a coded secret tongue uh, because it has been directed directly to the Lord. Uh, the next phrase, but unto God, no man understand of him. So uh, you're praying in a tongue that nobody understands. And so woe be unto those pastors that say, oh, you can't speak in tongues because you got to interpret everything. The Bible doesn't say that. You read the 14th chapter carefully, uh, it doesn't make that statement. That's something that's going to talk to by man because the majority of those who say that don't subscribe to it anyway. They only speak in tongues. They don't believe it's a gift that is for us today. Uh, they don't understand the different ways in which it can be used to edify and to build up the child of God and to build up the church. Howbeit, in the spirit, he speak of mysteries. So a person who's speaking in other tongues is speaking not unto man. He's speaking unto God. And notice here, it's interesting. It said he's speaking mysteries. Uh, the word mysteries is from the Greek word uh, mysterion or more like mysterious, but it's musturion, is how you pronounce it, or mysterion is, I think, the actual pronunciation in the Greek, uh, which also means secrets. Uh, and it's the base meaning. The base meaning of it means to shut the mouth. Uh, it's something that's not supposed to be revealed uh, in open form and for all those that are there, unless you get permission from the Lord or you feel prompted to, to ask the Lord to reveal it to you so that you can share it with some Someone else. It may, they may not actually be in the room with you. They may be somewhere else, but you ask the Lord to interpret the tongue that you spoke when you were praying to him uh, because it may be, be uh, something that edifies the entire body or someone else uh, that the Lord will lead you to. So you can pray for interpretation, even though it was directed towards the Lord. Uh, the Lord will give you an interpretation so it can be shared with others if it's something that uh, is not supposed to be kept private. Praise the Lord. That which you speak to God is secret unless it is revealed by the gift of interpretation of tongues. So I, I just mentioned that. There are times when you may not want your communion with God to be revealed. When you speak in tongues, you are spiritually encrypting your communication with God so that Satan and his cohorts cannot intercept them and, and, and encumber the plan of God for your life. So a lot of times you're speaking in tongues because you have some secret uh, something that you need help with, and maybe some personal private thing that you don't want everybody to know about, but you're asking God for it. And since you're at church, you're going to pray in tongues. Since you're uh, at home by yourself, you need the Lord to articulate it, the Holy Spirit, to take what you're saying and to go before the Father as your intercessor and to say it in, in terms that are acceptable to God uh, to, to help you get your life in line. He say He leads you and, uh, and bring all things to your remembrance, and He'll show you things to come. So he's a, a guide also to guide us in what we're doing. There may be something in our life that prevents the Lord from answering. And so the Holy Spirit will prompt us, praise God, through our spirit, the things we need to do differently, to give us impressions so that if you have a petition with the prayer that you're praying, things, all things will be in line so that the Lord will grant it. You might be praying for a wife or praying for a husband. Uh, and you may not be ready for a husband, ready for a wife. And so that's what the uh, Holy Spirit is there to lead you and guide you into all truth, to help you clean things out of your life that perhaps shouldn't be there. It may not be a sin, but it would be something that would prevent you from being successful in marriage, uh, maybe your attitude or whatever. So he has different ways in which to assist us, uh, uh, to prepare us to receive from the hand of God. Some might object and say that uh, this is ludicrous. So let me read it again. God, 
is, is an encrypted so that the devil can't understand it, nor his cohorts, and uh, cannot interpret what you've uh, said in tongues to the Lord, uh, because the devil may come around and put a plan in place to stop it from becoming a reality. Uh, some might object and say uh, that it's ludicrous uh, because Satan, before the fall, was covering God's covering cherub. And he was one of the three covering cherubs. He fell from grace, praise the Lord, and was stripped of his position. Um, and so people say, well, he was a covering cherub, so he knows all languages. Uh, a number of people say that. Sometimes even learned people will say that. Uh, I'm going to share that and, and prove to you from the scriptures that uh, that's not true. The following excerpt from the time of Daniel, we're going to get into it right now. Uh, the prophet states that none of the wise men of Babylon, uh, who by implication were emissaries of Satan, uh, who interpreted the, uh, could interpret the handwriting that was written on the wall of the king's palace, uh, the hand of the Lord, uh, during the time of Daniel. And so we'll read the actual excerpt. And Daniel was a prophet, the prophet of God, who was uh, summoned to come and read the handwriting because none of those uh, mystics and, and those who worked in the court of the king to deal with secret things could reveal what the handwriting on the wall was. So let's read the actual script. It's found in Daniel, the fifth chapter, verses 1 through 31. Uh, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast. So they're about to have a large feast. Uh, to thousands of his, notice this, uh, Lord. It says a thousand, so I'm not sure. I'd have to look at that in the uh, Hebrew to see if they meant uh, 1,000 or thousands. But the point is a lot of people. And they drank wine before uh, the thousand. Second verse. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, notice he's drinking his wine, enjoying it, commanded to bring in, that wasn't sufficient, he went to bring in the golden and silver vessels, listen to this, which his father actually, uh, if you look at the Hebrew, he's really talking about his father-in-law, excuse me, his grandfather. Nebuchadnezzar was his father-in-law, who was also king, and who had been king, but by this time he had expired. Had taken out, and so he's telling, the Bible is telling us the source of the, the cups uh, and the silver the gold and the silver vessels that he's going to drink from, partake of, and utilize during his party, he said it came from what uh, had been garnished by, uh, gathered together, and uh, plundered from Israel uh, by his grandfather, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, when they brought the Israelis, in this particular instance, the Jews, into captivity as slaves. Oh, you understand that? So they went and they plundered what was in the king's treasure chest, and uh, we'll talk about that and tell you how that happened, too. And so you have a good uh, conception of how the Lord works. See, Lord, he, he works in centuries sometimes, and he, uh, his prophets may also. Uh, not like the prophets of today, a lot of them. Some of them can, but uh, we'll also handle that in just a moment. So just give me time, and I think we'll bring some clarity to some things we've seen that are contrary uh, to what God wants to be operational uh, in this world today. Things have been used improperly. And the prophetic gifts have been used improperly. And we're going to bring things back in order via the word of God. So again, uh, Daniel, the fifth chapter, second verse. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels, which his father, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. So uh, we'll get there later and talk about that. That the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines my drink, drink therein. So he wanted to, them to bring in all of this precious jewelry and things of that nature. Uh, not the jewelry, but the cups, uh, probably plates and uh, glasses, uh, vessels that were used uh, to, to drink wine and have a party. Uh, so he went into um, his treasure, which he had taken from Israel and brought in uh, as plunder when they brought in the Jews and, and made them slaves in Israel uh, during the captivity. 70-year captivity, and I'm not going to get into great detail. You have to read your Old Testament so you'll understand these things, but I'll just give you a little snippet so that you'll be in sync with me. Third verse, again, Daniel, the fifth chapter, third verse. Uh, when they brought the golden vessels, so they went into the treasury and brought out the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, uh, which was in Jerusalem. It's talking about the house of God, the, uh, the God of Israel, uh, the Jewish people's God. Jehovah God, 
and the king and his princes, wise and his concubines drank in them. So uh, they drank out of those vessels that they'd brought into the party. Fourth verse. They drank wine, praised the gods of gold and silver, of brass, iron, whatever they were drinking, utensil they were using. Uh, if it was wood, they praised the god of wood. If it was iron, they praised the god, you know, any, every god was sufficient to them. Sounds like some people today. Um, and of stone. So if the goblet was out of stone, they praised the god of stones. Fifth verse, uh, Daniel 5 and uh, 5. In the same hour came forth the fingers of a man's hand. Just look at that. Fingers of a man's hand came forth and wrote uh, against a candlestick on the, the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. So can you imagine it's a hand just start writing on the wall? And notice it wasn't the whole hand, it was a portion of the hand that's right. So you can see the fingers writing on the wall, something that was indistinct. And we'll talk about it. Hand uh, wrote on the wall. So this is where you hear the expression, the handwriting on the wall. It's talking about something that's ominous, something that is uh, perhaps prophetic, something that's supernatural. And so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the following scripture uh, during the time of uh, the prophet Isaiah and also during the time of Hezekiah. Because Hezekiah was a king when uh, the treasury was plundered in Israel and taken away. Well, it wasn't taken away then, but it was prophesied at the time that uh, Hezekiah was king and interpreted by uh, uh, what he had shared was a, prophet, a prophecy for the future and the one who interpreted it was Isaiah. So let me give you uh, the scenario and the background to what happened and how that special uh, cups and goblets ended up in uh, Babylon. Isaiah 31 and 9. Sometimes we see these things happen and we don't have the full understanding of how big our God is. And so this is one of the times where uh, I think we need to go back and see where did those uh, goblets and, and uh, utensils of gold and silver come from that they were drinking during their party. And, uh, and uh, you'll have a better understanding of why the Lord came and wrote on the wall uh, because they really uh, were, that was dis they were disrespecting him because even because Israel was turned over to uh, Babylon and was allowed to go into captivity, the Lord had, see, here's the other scriptures, the Lord had prophesied that would take place if they were disobedient and didn't live for him the way they should. If they didn't carry themselves as God's people, he turned them over to the devil's crowd. And really, uh, the uh, Babylonians were the devil's crowd. And so the Lord told them that's what would happen. I wouldn't say, I'm not going to protect you, I'm going to turn you over to the devil and his agents. And that's what took place. So let's continue here. Uh, Isaiah 31, 39 and 1. And at that time, more dark, let, let me just pronounce, it's a difficult word. <laughs> it's a Babylonian word. Morodach Bala, Baladin. Morodach Baladin. It was the son of Baladin, king of, of uh, Babylon. Uh, he sent letters and, and, and a present to Hezekiah, who was king of, of, of Judah at that time, uh, an Israeli. And he had... Uh, heard that he had been sick. So here's a fellow from Babylon. He said he heard that the king of, of uh, Judah, uh, Hezekiah, was sick. So he's in these presents. Yeah, that's how people do, try to get you, put your guard down. And, uh, and that he was in recovery. Look at the 39 and 2. And Hezekiah was so glad for them. You got to be careful about the gifts you get. <laughs> uh, he shows them the house of the precious things. So he was so happy that he opened up the, the treasury to show him all the nice things God had blessed him with. See, sometimes you need to keep your mouth shut about what God has blessed you with. Be careful who you're sharing it with. They may have an ulterior motive. And this person certainly had an ulterior motive. And listen, uh, he showed him the silver, he showed him the gold, and he showed him the spices. And during that time, spices were very valuable. They could be as more expensive than gold and, and silver, depending on what it is. And so even today, you have some people from that area uh, you wonder, why got a spice house here in, in the U.S.? Because people from that culture and from that particular area, they use different spices in their food and also the fragrance for their houses, and they love it. So they'll spend a large sum of money for spices. So spices were very valuable during that time. Plus, they like to spice their food so they could taste it. Unfortunately, our country has not gotten into those things, and so we have to find out ways, sometimes from our own culture, we figure out how we can spice the meat so it tastes better. And you get a big old hunk of steak, and you eat it and say, oh, how in the world, how detestable. You know, this is just meat. There's no flavor. 
uh, and I've eaten some of those. We spent a whole bunch of money, fifty dollars for a steak, uh, forty dollars for a steak, and you say, "Oh man, this is going to be good." And you taste it; it's nothing but meat, no seasoning of any kind. And so, people back in those cultures uh, esteem spices and things of that nature. You talking about the spice routes, and they, they really did have spice routes uh, that people would uh, walk on to get from where they live to some distant place to to buy spices and bring them back home. And so they, he took the, he showed them the spices. This is uh, Hezekiah showing uh, Balanin's son, who's now the king of, of Babylon, showed him his spices and the pr precious ointments. That's something else that people used in those cultures. Uh, ointments, not just for salve to stop healing, stop uh, pains and things, but salve uh, for smell. And also it may be have uh, medicinal purposes to eliminate uh, joint pains and all sorts of other things. Praise the Lord. And all the house of his armor. So he showed this guy uh, that was a king of Babylon. All the armor where it was kept. And uh, all that was found in his treasure. Everything was in his treasure. He showed him everything. Uh, there was nothing in the house. Nor in his dominion. That Hezekiah showed them not. Now this is Isaiah 39 and 3. You'll learn some things here. That you probably won't hear very often. I'm a, I'm a teacher. That's one of my gifts. So I'm very thorough with what I present. If you listen to me over a period of time, you'll learn a lot about the Word of God and how to apply these things that are shared in the Word of God in future situations that you might encounter. It'll stop you from running your mouth when you need to keep your mouth shut. Just a scripture like this. And I'll, I listen to some of these pastors that are, are blessed with them. It's okay to have a mega church, but you don't tell everybody everything about the blessings God has brought to you. And yet it's in bragging on the cars they have and bragging on how many houses they have and bragging on their furniture and just really just uh, showing pride. You need to keep your mouth shut on a lot of things. Now, there may be a few people you share with, but not everybody. Some things are to be reserved, not for everybody to hear. And so we need to learn some sense. When to keep your mouth shut and when to speak. So uh, Isaiah 39 and 3. Then came Isaiah, the sin as the prophet came now, after he even showed this crooked man. He don't know he's crooked yet. But this fellow had feigned uh, being concerned about Hezekiah being sick and that he's recovering. So he brought him uh, a few things, tidbits, uh, a present. And then he opened up all his treasure chests and showed him everything. Because some people, you think, if I, if I show the person this, they'll, they'll respect me. And uh, that I'm being blessed as a servant of God. They may hate you because the envy may be in their heart. So and that's where some people are. And if you don't have discernment, you may not know it. You may not know some things until years later. I've had that happen to me, that I showed and directed and gave everything I had. And then uh, I find out less than 10 years, the person envies me, uh, hates the fact that God has blessed me. And they don't understand that they can be blessed the same way because God's no respect to person. So they didn't hear all of the text that they needed to hear and didn't put it in their heart. And so then you got an enemy. He said, what did, where did this come from? He just hated you from the beginning, probably. At some point, he allowed the devil to, to trick him and turn him into somewhere he don't like you anymore. So the first uh, five years, you then directed him, taught him every scripture you could think of and how to apply it. And then the next five years, you had to open the heart up and allow Satan to come in and spoil all the good things that God has put in the heart. And so... If you haven't encountered it, I sure have, and I know of some others too haven't, who have encountered it. Uh, Isaiah 39 and 3. Then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, What said these men? So he's asking, These men came and brought you a gift and all from Babylon. What did they say to you? And from where came they? He didn't even know at this point unto thee. And Isaiah said, They are come from. Uh, notice this, a far country unto me, even from Babylon. So he's telling the prophet, the prophet had a, a word from the Lord. This we, We're going to talk about these gifts of the Spirit, the ninefold gifts of the Spirit. We're just talking about, right now we're focusing on tongues, but since he came up, we're also going to talk about a little bit about interpretation of tongues, and also, in this case here, what is called the word of knowledge. It's a fragmentary piece of information from the mind of God about past things, present things, and even future things. Now, let me just say this. A word is the, the, um, the intentions of the heart and things of that nature. Why a person is doing certain things. Why, why they're going to do it. And in detail, some details of how they're going to do it. Praise God. I mean, of when it's going to take place. And then you get into, I'll talk about word of wisdom a little later on. But right now, it's word of knowledge. 
and then shortly we're going to get into a, a prophecy that's going to be given. So prophecy has to do with foretelling the future, what's going to happen in the future, uh, where the knowledge has to do with revealing the elements of the men, how, why, what's in the attitude of heart for the future for you, how they're going to, what they're going to maneuver and do that's negative towards you. And then prophecy also talks about how they're going to, all the things they're going to do in, in the future. So the future aspect is always when the person is prophesying, it's a future aspect or foretelling. And now I'm doing some foretelling right now while I'm speaking to you. This is a prophetic gift that God will give you where you can tell, take the word of God and foretell it. In other words, we're speaking under inspiration. But then there's two aspects of it. And the primary reason why people uh, prophesy is to foretell the future. Uh, even though I'm foretelling, I am prophesying to you right now, especially when I move away from my notes and allow the Lord to inculcate other things that need to be disseminated to you. That's a prophetic word. However, if I say something's going to happen in the future and give you details about it, then that's a prophetic word. If I talk more about the people and what's in their mind, what they're going to do, that's more of word of knowledge and word, uh, word of knowledge. And uh, then if I get into a problem that's going to resolve, we get into word of wisdom. But I'm going to get into that today. Word of knowledge is one on here. Let's continue. Uh, Isaiah 39, 3. Then came Isaiah. The prophet unto um, King Hezai and said unto him, okay, here we go. He said, what said these men? And where did they come from? He told them he came from Babylon. Let's go to Isaiah 39 and 4. Then said he, okay, uh, what have they seen? So now this is the, the prophet asking questions. Where did people come from? What did you show them? No, what, what did they say to you? Uh, now then the, the fourth verse is, what have they seen in thine house? What did you reveal to them that was in your house? Private things. And Hezekiah answered, all that is in my house. He said, I showed them everything. Uh, um, he says, all my house have they seen. They saw everything. Uh, there is nothing among my treasures, he let me know, that they have not, that I have not shown them. That's something, isn't it? Uh, so the following... Uh, Verse here uh, is Isaiah. He's prophesying a uh, word of knowledge to, he's prophesying and he's giving a word of knowledge to um, the king Hezekiah. I'm going through this because people get confused about what is word of knowledge, what is word of wisdom, and what is prophecy. Many times uh, there may be a word of knowledge and they call it a prophecy, or it may be a prophecy and they should have called it a word of knowledge because it's an area that people don't get intimately involved and they don't take the time to sit and listen to the Lord, direct them. And when they're reading scriptures and stories, they don't make the uh, analysis. Is this a prophecy or is this a word of knowledge? Sometimes the word of God, you have to stop and think about it in order to come to an understanding of when do we use certain gifts that God gives people. Uh, Hezekiah 39 and 5, oh, excuse me, Isaiah 39 and 5, there's no such thing as Hezekiah. <laughs> So forgive me. Isaiah 39 and 5. Watch this. Uh, then said Isaiah to Hezekiah. So this is the prophet Isaiah speaking to Hezekiah. Uh, so he operates in the prophetic gift. And the word of knowledge existed even back during that time. Let me just say this to you so you don't get confused. In our day, uh, after the Holy Spirit has come, uh, it, the Holy Spirit lives resident within, uh, within us in the, uh, either a... Uh, salvation measure, we drink of the Spirit of God, or in a Holy Ghost baptismal measure, which is a full uh, importation of the Holy Spirit in, in, our, in our spirit man. And we activate it by our will. Praise God. If you look to the Old Testament, many times when the prophecy is getting ready to take place, and the Word of God came upon them saying, that's the same as the Holy Spirit coming out of us saying. And so it's a different dispensation. He said that the Holy Spirit is going to be resident inside of our inner part. Our innermost parts, uh, after uh, this dispensation comes on. It was prophesied by the prophets of old that we would live in a dispensation in which the Holy Spirit is a resident guest. He didn't just come upon us from the exterior, and now I have, a, on this particular situation, now I have the Holy Spirit with me to tell me what to do. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom, prophetic word. Now I'll just say this. The prophets of old, some of them, not all of them, there are very few who had that prophetic ability to do that. But for certain people who were... Uh, closely connected to the Lord and yielded to him, the more often he came upon them saying, you look at the book of Jeremiah and various other prophets too, like Isaiah, 
many times it'll say came upon them saying that's the Holy Spirit coming upon them and taking them to another level so the gifts of the Spirit will operate through them. Word of knowledge, word of wisdom. Uh, they didn't speak in tongues in those days uh, like we do in this dispensation, but there was a tongue that was spoken and an interpretation given, and we'll get into that uh, momentarily. Just stay with me. You'll learn some things, how this is put together. People get so confused. You're not going to be confused. See, the, author is, the devil is the author of confusion. I'm going to undo as much as I can if you listen to me. Uh, stay with me. Isaiah 39 and 6. Behold, the days come that all that is in thine house, this is the prophet uh, Isaiah speaking to Hezekiah, and that which the fa uh, thy fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. This is a prophetic word. He's telling him what's going to happen in the future. Nothing shall be left said the Lord. So if we roll forward to Daniel, the fifth chapter, with uh, Belteshazzar, we found that uh, he, he did. He, his father, Nebuchadnezzar, took all the wealth to Babylon, and now he's going to make a drink out of it, which was an insult to God, as if uh, this came from, they didn't believe that the, the Lord, especially his next generation, uh, this third generation, didn't know, didn't have the, he had the background, but didn't listen to it, about the, the supernatural element and the fact that what the Lord permitted them to bring wasn't something for them to take and play with. That the Jehovah God still uh, made sure that there was a, a, a sanctum of the things that belonged to him, even though it was misused by the Israelis. And so you get these heathens coming in, using something that really was uh, set aside and made available by the Lord. And so now he's going he's gonna to cause a problem in their life. So that's why the handwriting on the wall came up that here they're disrespecting the implements that we use in praise and worship and things of that nature. And I allowed them, Babylon, to take it from my people. And now they're going to insult me as if I don't exist. So he said, I got a word for you. <laughs> he started writing on the wall. Now you understand the background. Stay with me here. Uh, and so uh, let's go to Isaiah 39 and 7. And thy sons uh, that thou shalt issue from thee. At that time, Hezekiah didn't have a son, but later we find out after he was healed, the Lord gave him a son. And the, that's another word that you all need to understand. See, um, Hezekiah wasn't supposed to have a son. And uh, the Lord blessed him and let him have one. And the son became a very wicked king. Then I'll just start with that. See, if he just stayed like he was and not, the Lord not allow his womb, to, his, uh, um, for him to have a child, uh, then there wouldn't have been a problem like that. But his son was a wicked person. And let's just stop. Uh, which they shall be get. He's talking here, the prophet's talking to him, telling the sons and the, the issue that which comes out of your bowels that you shall bring into the earth realm. He says that, uh, he said they're going to be taken away. He's talking about Babylon going to come and take them away. So that's a prophetic word. And they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. So uh, here, and let's go to um, all this happened in 712 B.C. I'm just going to show you God's word. It used to be in Bibles. I had to go get my old Bible when I was a kid to explain that. And so uh, here we're, it's being explained. Then the handwriting on the wall. What's this? Is, the handwriting on the wall of King Belshazzar, excuse me, I said it wrong a while ago. That's his name. Belshazzar, king of Babylon, occurred in 538 B.C. So in 712 B.C., watch this here. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in and took uh, Judah to Babylon. In 538, excuse me, this was prophesied. Okay, this happened, the actual Babylon came in and taken them captive, happened in 712 B.C. And so here we have uh, all that happened. In, okay. Yes, then the handwriting on the wall, which we're going to talk about, because it was in a dialect nobody understood except the man of God, and we'll get to that point before we conclude today. Uh, in 538, uh, the grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar, came in in 5, excuse me, 98. So the prophet spoke this in 712 B.C. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in 598 B.C. Are you with me here? And all a part of Israel people was brought into bondage in Babylon. So follow the time. Therefore, Isaiah's prophecy took 114 years to be fulfilled. Then the handwriting on the wall, so after they made slaves in Babylon, the handwriting on the wall took place. Praise the Lord. Um, and uh, after Babylon took control of Judah. So, again, 
the prophet is speaking about what's going to happen to the Israelis, 712 B.C., uh, the handwriting on the wall of King, Be uh, King of Babylon occurred in 538 B.C. So you can see that's quite a few years. Uh, his father came in in 598 B.C. just before his, his grandfather. And so you get to look at all these years that have gone on. The, the Lord, if you just follow his word, there's no way he's talking about the Bible. It, the historical accounts show that this has actually took place, just like the Bible said it would. Praise the Lord. And I'll just leave that alone. Uh, just meditate on that a while. It'll help your faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As we're going through the word of God here so you can uh, have some faith for the things that God can do and will do. Let's go to the third verse here of... Uh, yeah, we're going back to the third verse of uh, Daniel, the fifth chapter. Uh, then they brought the golden vessels in that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was in Jerusalem. You understand the background. Enough where you can uh, understand what took place. And the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. Uh, they drank wine and praised, watch this here, and praised the gods of gold and of silver, brass, iron, uh, wood, and of stone. Fifth, in the same hour, uh, the f uh, four fingers, what is it, the fourth fingers of a man's hand wrote uh, over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall uh, and uh, the king uh, saw a part of the hand. Now look at the sixth verse. Then the king, this was happened when he saw that handwriting on the wall uh, was changed. He was, he was uh, jovial and happy, having a great old time, howling, screaming probably, if they do those kind of things in the Middle East. <laughs> I think they did <laughs> during the party. And his thoughts were troubled because he saw this handwriting on the wall so that the joints of his legs were loose. You ever had that where you're so scared your knees whacked against each other? I have. I have. Uh, I, I've shared that testimony about that. It says, and his knees smote one against the other. That's when you're so frightened, you don't know what your mouth is quivering and your legs are bouncing because he's in the handwriting on the wall and you don't understand what that is. That's scary. Look at the seventh verse. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers, bring in the Chaldeans, and bring in the soothsayers. And the king spake and said unto the wise men of Babylon, Whosoever shall read this writing and shall show me the interpretation uh, thereof, he shall be clothed, notice that, with scarlet and have a chain of gold around his neck. It says, he shall be the third ruler in my kingdom. Look at A first. Then came unto the king wise men, but they could not read the writing uh, nor make it known to the king the interpretation thereof. Nice verse. Then was king uh, Belteshazzar troubled, and his countenance was changed in him. And the lords uh, were astonished. Tenth verse. Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king, and the lords came unto the banquet hall, and the queen spake unto the king, and she said, Live forever. Let not these thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. Eleventh verse. Five, um, Daniel 5 and 11. There is a man in the king. Oh, God. As is always somebody, God's man, in whom is the spirit of the holy God. And in the days of thy father, that is actually his grandfather, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, were found in him, Daniel, on whom the, the god, the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy grandfather, uh, and some of the New York translations put that in there, uh, and the king, I say, thy grandfather, made master of the musicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and the uh, soothsayer. In other words, he had been promoted because he knew the answers to all the questions. It says, for as much as an excellent spirit, this is Daniel that's being described here, and knowledge and understanding, interpretation of dreams, and showing of hard sentences, and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel whom the king uh, named Belteshazzar. Now, it says, now let Daniel be called, and he shall show the interpretation. So that was the resolution, 13th verse. Then was Daniel brought before the king and all of uh, the king spake and said unto Daniel, Art thou uh, that Daniel, which are of the children of the captivity Judah, uh, whom the king, my father, grandfather, uh, brought out of Jewry, uh, being a Jew, out of Judah, 14th verse, I, I have even heard of thee that the spirit, no, he had heard of him. It's funny how quickly we forget about things. Uh, but he wasn't saved. He wasn't committed to the Lord. He was a heathen. Spirit of the gods is in thee, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom is found in thee. 15 verse. And now, uh, no, 
wise men, the astrologers, have brought in before me that thou should read this writing. Because they couldn't read it. Nobody could read it. The devil's crowd didn't know what it was on the, written on the wall. And I said the same thing today. Uh, certain things that the Lord have written, it's not going to be a dialect that's known by man. It may be something that's a, a dead dialect. But the point was they won't be able to read it. If God don't want them to know, they won't know. You can't go get a lexicon and the smartest people in the world said they're going to interpret what said. No, they won't. If it's something that is hidden by God, only God's person will be able to interpret it. And make known unto me the interpretation thereof. But uh, they could not show the interpretation of, the, of these things. So I said that before. That the devil doesn't know all languages. His people, uh, agents of Satan, would tell you what it means. He brought in all these different classes of people who are contrary to the things of God. Mystical folks. Nobody knew the answer. 16 verse. And I have heard of thee that thou canst make interpretation and dissolve doubts. Now, if thou be canst read the writing and make known to me the interpretation thereof, thou shalt be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about thy neck and shalt be third ruler in the kingdom of Babylon. 17 verse. Then Daniel answered and said unto the king, Let thy gifts be to thyself, and give thy rewards to another. And I will read the writing unto the king, and make known to him the interpretation. Thou king, listen, O thou king, this is um, Daniel speaking, the most high, yeah, let me move a little quicker here. Um, o thou king, the most high, God gave Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, grandfather, a kingdom and majesty and glory and honor. 19 verse. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him, uh, whom he would he slew, and whom he would he kept alive, and whom he would he set up, and whom he would he put down. 29 verse. But when he, his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride, he was disposed deposed from the kingly throne and they took his glory from him and he was driven from the sons of men and his heart was made like the hearts um, of a beast and all his dwellings was with wild asses um, they fed him with grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of the heavens for seven years by the way till he knew that he the most high rule in the kingdoms of men. So today y'all worry about what's going on. The Lord's still in control, regardless of who's king, whoever is the uh, president. And that he appoints over it whomsoever he will. Donald Trump was appointed for his period. And he failed. He needs to read the book of Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe he'll get saved. I don't know. 22nd verse. And, and thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart. See, that's it. The Lord's watching. Even though they're heathens, they still have to humble their heart. Uh, uh, because he's the one that gave them what they have. Thou has knew of all these things, and now you knew all this stuff. You're his grandson, you knew all this stuff, and you still act a fool with what you did. But thou lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and thou hast brought the vessels of his house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods, then praise me, praised the gods of silver, gold, brass, iron, wood, stone, um, uh, which see not nor hear and know not and God uh, in whom thy hand is uh, breathe it and whose are all thy ways hast thou not glorified and I didn't get any glory I'm just verse. that was part of the hand uh, then was part of the hand sent and was writing and wrote the following uh, 5, 20, 5, 5. and this is the writing many many tekel ye Pharisee. this is an interpretation of that which was written many uh, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, uh, thou art weighed in the balances and uh, art wanting. No, you're lacking. You're not doing it. Paris, that means the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians because you didn't handle it properly. Uh, then commanded um, Nebuchadnezzar uh, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold around his neck. He made a proclamation, proclamation that he should be the third ruler in uh, the nation. And then the Medes that very day came in and slew Belshazzar, king of that same night. Uh, uh, the, the, his name was uh, Cyrus. I can't get into that today. Uh, and you follow me. Uh, Darius and the Medes came in and took the kingdom. So the Medes and the Persians did take over. And I'm just going to say this. The devil's crowd didn't know. The point is that he had no idea, no conception of what to do. 
And you learn a lot if you listen to me today that uh, he did not know the interpretation of the tongue. So that if you're speaking to the Lord, you need to ask the Lord for an interpretation if it's something that needs to be revealed. Be careful. Some things don't need to be revealed. If you just get charged up and built up from the uh, interruption operation of the Holy Spirit with our spirits and with the Lord's spirits and uh, uh, just leave it alone. The Lord will work with you. If it's something that needs to be interpreted, then the Lord will give you an prompt in your spirit. Ask the Lord to give you an interpretation of what it is and he will give it to you. But you can't be going to no soothsayer and all these other people watching the handwriting on the wall. It was the interpretation of tongues. Many, many tackle you Pharisees, and it took a man of God to interpret it by the Holy Spirit. God bless you, my friends. I'm excited. Come back next week and we'll finish up this story. But I think I'll give you enough to, to make you understand how these things operate, uh, interoperation between the different kinds of gifts, the word of knowledge uh, and uh, the gift of prophecy and the interpretation of tongues. And many, many tackle you fair, and that was a tongue, praise God. So it gives us some insight on how things operate in this dissipation in which we're living. Go with God. See you next time. This is Dr. Nutt. Hello. Thank you for listening to this resource. If you would like to receive our audio DVD catalog or desire more information about our ministry, you may write to us at P.O. Box 612-822, San Jose, California, 95161-2822. Or you may request information via our website at www.sjwofcc.org. We look forward to hearing from you. God bless you.